Welcome to the Maria Liberati Show, where food meets art, travel, and life. What does food mean to you? Tell me in a recorded soundbite of no longer than 60 seconds or a post of no longer than 50 words posted on social media with hashtag the Maria Liberati Show or email it directly to me at maria at marialiberati.com. And if your soundbite or quotes are selected to be part of an upcoming podcast segment, I will send you an autographed copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking, to you as a special thanks. I love having my listeners be part of the show, so please join in. Follow me now to Tuscany in 1452, the year a love child was born to Caterina, a peasant girl, and Ser Piero, a landowner. They could not marry because she was a peasant and he was a nobleman. The boy was homeschooled and never had any formal education. At the age of four or five, he began creating artistic sculptures when he visited his maternal father's bakery and created figures for marzipan. When he was 14 or so, he was sent to a private art school in Florence, and legend has it that while there, he took a job working as a waiter at a tavern on the Ponte Vecchio. One night, the chef died of food poisoning, and he had to step up as a chef. However, he quickly got fired because of his love of making dishes that looked artistic, and he was giving out smaller nouveau cuisine-type portions than what other establishments were making in the day. This artistic genius also happened to be a foodie. He then joined forces with a fellow art student in Florence to open their own tavern on the Ponte Vecchio. But the menus were made to look like works of art, the dishes as well. No one could understand anything, so this venture quickly closed. So who is the artist that went on to create some of the world's greatest masterpieces and more? The artist that loved animals so much he would buy caged birds just to set them free. If you guess Leonardo da Vinci, you are correct. And his restaurant partner, who was also a fellow art student, was none other than Sandro Botticelli. Yes, this is Italian culture, and since I couldn't get Leonardo da Vinci as a guest, who better to discuss Italian art and culture than my guest today, Dr. Laura Morelli. I'm excited to have as a special guest today, Dr. Laura Morelli, and she's the author of many books on Italian culture, art, and art history. Correct, Laura? Yes, that's right. Had anything else in there with all that? As if that's not enough. No, I I have, um, everything I write has revolves around art history. Art history is really my passion. And so I'm very happy um, studying Italy, as you can imagine, because there's so much art history there. I, I have a nonfiction side. Um, I have a series of books, the most well-known of which is probably Made in Italy. That's a shopper's guide. It leads people off the beaten path to uncover traditional artisans in every region of Italy. And then I'm also a, a historical novel. And there I try to bring the past to life through entertaining stories about Italian art history. So I have a, a fiction and a nonfiction side. And it's so interesting for anyone that's out there that hasn't read any of, um, of Laura's books. I love the way you use your expertise in art history to create these beautiful books like The Gondola Maker is so beautiful. So I love the way you, you know, you kind of use that but create this, you know, your books also. I think it's so, so beautiful the way you did that. Yes. Thank um, you. Thank you. You know, historical fiction readers, I think, always want to know, you know, what what's true and what's made up, you know, and, and what, what, what are the true stories behind these stories? And so for me, it's always a fun puzzle to plot out the history that we know and then imagine the history that we don't. You know, you can always imagine conversations that may have taken place or events that may have happened that uh, no longer leave a trace in the historical record. So it's a lot of fun for me as a historical novelist to, to see where the, the information ends and where the imagination can begin. Well, and that passion is definitely reflected in your, in your books also. So we can certainly tell that. So I wanted to ask you, 
Um, since this segment is the second part of my segments on Italian arts and culture, last week I spoke to Elisa Celli, who wrote a lot of books in the 80s and 90s on Italian culture, but more relating to food and wine. But I wanted to ask you, so what is your perspective on how Italian culture has changed throughout the years? Oh, that's a good question. Well, you know, certainly since I've been working on Italian culture in the last 25 years, I've seen a lot of changes. Um, you know, with regard to the culture of, let's say, let's call it made in Italy, and specifically to traditional artisans, it's been interesting to me to watch things evolve. You know, I, th I think about Italy as a country powered by mom and pop enterprises. You know, these small stores and artisanal enterprises are really the, the heart of the Italian economy. And, you know, starting in probably the late 80s, early 90s, we started to see some Italian fashion brands collect into these massive luxury goods conglomerates, you know, Gucci, Bottega Veneta, these venerable, um, you know, Italian brands that used to be artisanal mom and pop shops got gobbled up by these larger conglomerates. And I started to get a little concerned when I saw these quaint streets turn into these quick, you know, uh, slickly merchandised streets with chain stores, and I was worried for a bit. But um, honestly, I've been heartened within the last decade to see that alongside those luxury stores, we still can duck down the side streets and find a huge variety of makers of everything from pottery to glass to leather goods, wood crafts, metalwork. I mean, the artisanal life of Italy is still very vibrant. In fact, um, you know, recently I was in Venice and I had been sad to see one of the, the oldest mask making shops close its doors after several generations and another paper shop that was one of my favorites that unfortunately closed its doors. But then I met a few um, younger people who had started new enterprises that were still um, steeped in this tradition. And so I have a lot of hope uh, and I'm very optimistic about the future of artisanal enterprises specifically specifically in Italy, because I think there's still a lot of lifeblood there. Yes. And that's, I'm glad to hear that there's a, you're optimistic about that because I know I found that and was just so disappointed when I started seeing these Italian fashion brands that were very artisanal, becoming these gigantic conglomerates and the clothing is just not clothing and shoes and handbag are, are just not what they used to be. So it's good to hear that, you know, there's these still these mom and pop uh, types of places and, and shops and things with, you know, craftspeople popping up, uh, still, still flourishing. That's what I mean to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Absolutely. That, that's good to hear that. So what got you into the world of, of art history? Did that passion start before your trip to Venice? Well, I grew up in a rural part of Georgia, and I actually, from a, as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a writer. That was my dream, and I also used to say to my parents that maybe I would be an archaeologist. So I feel very <laughs> lucky that I sort of got to got to do what I wanted to do when I was four years old. Um, but you know, it wasn't until I had the opportunity at about twelve years old to travel to Europe that I realized there was this whole tangible history of medieval art and Renaissance art uh, that was missing in the U.S. and I was just fascinated by it and went on to study art history in school, ended up at Yale University working on a PhD. And, um, you know, I realized in Italy specifically that it was a place where you could, where the past was still living, you know, where you could still see how people were uh, blowing glass, for example, in the same way that they were in the 1200s and 1300s. You know, it was this kind of window onto this centuries old past that really fascinated me. And so I decided to um, study art history and, and I started out in academia teaching art history at the college level. Um, but then, as I mentioned, I, I brought back the writing because that was an itch that needed to be scratched. And so I, I definitely feel like I'm at home now with, with historical fiction. <laughs> oh, that's very, very interesting. So since we can't travel right now with all the stay at home orders, um, what would you suggest people can do to engross themselves in the art of Italy and get that experience? 
Well, you know, there's um, it's really cool to see how quickly the big Italian museums and cultural organizations got on board with virtual experiences. I think that's really awesome. You may have heard about the huge blockbuster exhibition that was planned this year and was mounted in Rome um, to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the death of the painter Raphael. This Raphael 2020 was supposed to be one of the biggest blockbuster art exhibitions ever staged in Italy. And um, unfortunately, it you know, went went online. But but that's also good for us because we can still experience the incredible work of Raphael online. Um, you know, also the Uffizi, the Vatican Museums have mounted some online exhibitions so you can experience their collections. I know I have some friends who have started doing virtual tours and live chats. Um, I was recently online with Monica Cesarato in Venice. She's got a great series where she talks with a, with someone different every every day at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. So check that out. Um, I'm actually offering a free online course right now on the art of the ancient Etruscans. Anybody who loves Italy probably knows something about the Etruscans, um, but anybody who wants to join me there can sign up online. It's at at lauramorelli.com slash Etruscans. And um, I've had a blast with that. I love the ancient Etruscans, so it's been really fun. Wow. Oh, definitely. I would recommend to everyone to do that. That sound that sounds very interesting. Yes, the history of Italy is so uh, there. There's so much there with the Etruscans. So that would be very interesting and a real good way to get an idea of a lot of the foundation. So definitely. Um, and Laura, again, where's that? So that's at lauramorelli.com, right? People yes, can find Laura it. Yes, lauramorelli.com slash Etruscans. Etruscans. And, you know, Maria. I mean, if you know, for anybody who's passionate about food and Italian. Italian food. I mean, the Etruscans are, I mean, they, they are really the origin story of Italian food culture with their love of banqueting and wine and food and entertaining. And, you know, there are all these uh, ancient stories about their elaborate banquets where there were, you know, kids running crazy and, you know, things that you can <laughs> easily imagine. <laughs> yes, they don't, yes. They don't sound too different than, so, you know, than no, kids. than today's yeah. Italians. Yes, I was going to say so that's where it all stems from and that makes that's very interesting yes so so you've recently released a novel on Michelangelo's David yes I I have a new novel coming out May 31st so just about to come out it's called The Giant and uh-huh. it's a story of the creation of Michelangelo's David. Uh-huh. So I'm very, very excited about that. And then I have another book coming out in September called The Night Portrait that's based on the history of Leonardo da Vinci's portrait of uh, the lady with the ermine. Um, oh, wow. That's an interesting portrait because um, it has an interesting uh, history in the 15th century, but it also has an interesting story in the 20th century because it was one of the... Um, things that Adolf Hitler put his sights on at the beginning of World War II. And so it was uh, one of the most sought after things uh, for the Nazis to take. So this historical novel that I've written is a dual timeline story that goes back and forth between the creation of the portrait in Da Vinci's day to uh, the 1940s when it was stolen during World War II. Um, so that's been a fun project too. Something a little wow. different. Yeah, that does. And that sounds really very, very interesting. So tell us, um, I have one more question for you, but before I do that, so where can people find out about these novels? Again, going to lauramorelli.com. Yes, you'll find everything there. lauramorelli.com is the easiest way to find me and it's M-O-R-E-L-L-I. Yes. And the question that I ask all my guests is, what does food mean to you? Well, I think that like art, food is 100% cultural. So, you know, whenever I have lived away from the American South, for example, I have always dreamed of coming home and eating the food that I grew up with, you know, (laughs) grits and biscuits and black eyed peas and cornbread. And I think that, you know, there's so much about food that is associated with a place. And, um, you know, for Italy, I mean, how 
how more true could that be? You just think about all of the the world class food traditions that have transcended the the, the borders of Italy, like Parmigiano Reggiano cheese, balsamic vinegar of Modena, and you know, by the way, these are artisanal traditions as well. They're they're really no different in the way they're produced um, from you know a a leather bag. Let's say they're they, these are uh, secrets that are passed down from generation to generation. So there's a lot of affinity there, I think, between um, Italian food and Italian art. So definitely, no, that's that's a great answer. Yes, Italian. I always say Italian cooking and Italian eating are really an an art form, and you just kind of confirmed it. Yes, it is. It's Absolutely. art and culture, definitely. Well, Laura, thank you so much for joining me, and um, hopefully, we'll be able to chat with you in the future too. And I am really looking forward to to your next two books, and uh, hopefully, we're going to have a lot of people joining you on that that uh, chat about the Etruscans. That sounds really interesting. So that's lauramorelli.com. Absolutely. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Thank Maria. You. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining us and listening to the Maria Liberati Show. If you have any recipes that were inspired by Florence, Rome, or Venice that you want to show off, take a picture of your homemade favorite dish and hashtag the Marie Liberati Show. Post the photo on social media. We'll be gathering pictures and posting it on my website in the next few weeks. Thanks to my producer, Britton Rizel, and this week's guest, Dr. Laura Morelli, author and art historian at lauramorelli.com. Go to my website, marialiberati.com, to keep up with my blog and the show and my book series, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. And don't forget to post your answer to the question, what does food mean to you, in a recorded soundbite of no longer than 60 seconds or a social media post of no longer than 50 words and hashtag it, The Maria Liberati Show. Post on social media or email it to me at maria at marialiberati.com. If your quotes are selected for an upcoming podcast segment, you will receive an autographed copy of my book, The Basic Art of Italian Cooking. I'd love to hear from you. And as always, if you have any questions or ideas for upcoming segments, email me directly at maria at marialiberati.com. Until next time, peace, love, and pasta.